Good evening, everyone. Um, it's great to see all you all tonight. This is Doug Cook. I use he, him pronouns, and I live on occupied Pawtucket land in South Hamilton, Massachusetts, in the Ipswich River watershed. Um, tonight, we are excited to have ML Altabelli, and our presentation is Starting a New Raised Bed Garden. First, I'd like to thank all the NOFAMAS staff and board who have helped to make this event possible. As well, we want to thank our sponsors. Tonight, Chelsea Green Publishing, an employee-owned company, brings in-depth practical content about organic gardening and more to life with books, ebooks, and audiobooks. Go to chelseagreen.com and enter code PWEB35 at checkout to re receive a special NOFAMAS Resilient Garden Series discount from your next print purchase. Chelsea Green Publishing, cultivating change from the ground up. As well, Ward's Nursery, they pride themselves on being a leader in offering horticultural products you can count on, knowledge, uh, knowledgeable staff you can trust, and friendly customer service. Ward's Nursery, Garden Center, where gardeners grow, located in Great Barrington, Massachusetts. And Black Earth Compost, who they divert food scraps from landfills to provide Massachusetts with nutrient-rich compost, soil blends, raised bed kits, and much more. And you can learn more about Black Earth Compost at blackearthcompost.com. So thank you to all of our sponsors. Of course, most importantly, we want to thank you, the viewers and listeners, I, I, especially I can't our talk. members I mean, who make our education and advocacy work possible. And before we begin, I'd like to take a moment for you all to try and locate yourself on this map, which we have just posted a link into the chat. Please consider learning more about not only the history of the indigenous people who once resided and managed the land where you live, but learn also about their present day political structures, issues, and goals. Please consider making solidarity work with local black and indigenous groups a part of your environmental and land-based work. We owe so much of what we know about how to grow food and manage land in a way that is regenerative and ecologically responsible to not only the people who were here before colonization, but the people who were brought to the United States as slaves. Rather than erase them, we should honor and support and seek justice for their descendants who have survived centuries of oppression and white supremacy. And with that, thank you very much. I'm going to turn the screen sharing over to ML. All right. Good evening, everyone. Um, I admit this is a different venue for me. I'm not used to um, doing a PowerPoint presentation quite like this um, without seeing an audience. So um, we're gonna do the best we can with it. I wanted to give you a little bit of a background on myself. I know the audience that I'm talking to is um, gonna be mostly um, uh, NOFA uh, small scale farmers. And I'm actually a fine garden landscaper. Um, which means that I work on through the years uh, over 150 sites. So I've had a lot of experience with a lot of different kinds of soils, a lot of different kinds of gardens, a lot of different kinds of gardeners. And um, it's those kind of, well, got to make it work one way or another that have sort of taught me what I'm going to try and walk you through tonight. Some of the screens are going to have an awful lot of writing on them. And I want you to know that Doug is going to be able to post a worksheet somehow, some way that has all of those formulas slash recipes on them. I also want to point out that as we start going through this, they are recipes like any other recipe. They are, they will get you started, but they do not um, mean that they are the end of the story for you guys. You're going to be working out your own solutions as you get going with this stuff. So hang on, I got to find my little cursor thing here. Okay. So um, the, we're starting off with a picture that um, is actually at the library in the town that I um, am the agricultural chair for. And so these are two demonstration raised beds that are this year five years old. Um, this is from, these pictures are from 2019. Last year, 2020, COVID really blew the working groups that we had. So they were more, um, they weren't quite as good looking last year. So this is the picture from the year before. Um, this picture is a representation of a raised bed garden for Perkins School for the Blind in Watertown, Massachusetts. And for 25 years, I have been working with them. They just, as of COVID-19 last year, they just um, 
dismantled the, the, that program, which is a real bummer. Um, but I wanted to point out that these are not natural events. When you're doing raised beds, they, this has nothing to do with in-ground growing or any of the things that you expect. Um, everything is magnified. And I put this picture up because in this picture, okay, so I'm hoping you guys can see this because um, in my, okay. Over in the right-hand corner, you'll see the exact same garden. And I'm gonna go back and show you, you can see, I can't use a cursor. Um, you can see that some of these um, beds are empty. Some of them are very stressed. Um, I started working on these outside gardens, long boring story, but I wanted to show you that getting it right gives you this kind of a look. Um, and this is a late August picture. So you're in the heat. This is in Watertown, Massachusetts. So when the heat hits in this field, this is a Wester, westerly field, the heat hits. Um, but you can see the, the production is still there. Up in the left-hand corner is a um, close-up of the, of the garden that we started with. Okay, um, I'm not necessarily reading everything that's on the screen to you. I'm assuming you're reading it and or you'll ask questions later on. Um, so just in case you're wondering why I'm blurring through all the words. And then we get to a page which has no pictures. Okay, so here's some of the points. You need to craft the, your soil from the ground up because compaction is what does in your gardens, um, your raised beds. And people don't think that because when they build their beds, um, the soil is very often loosened because you have had it dropped on a tarp and you're, you're, you're piling into the bed and it's so easy to plant that first year and everything works so well and it's, it's looking really good. And then the second year it doesn't do as well. And by the third year, you're wondering why the heck you even bother doing it because nothing is growing in it. There are real reasons why that happens. When you first build a garden soil, you're adding a huge amount of oxygen. So your bacteria, any bacteria that are in that soil are very actively um, ex expanding and making whatever nutrition is in that soil available to your plants. And your plants love it and off you go. The bacteria burn out and you don't have any long range food source for either them or the fungi, which is what you really want. Um, and so slowly but surely you get um, soil settling and then you get soil compaction. Another thing, you wanna test the base loam that you're going to be working with. And the reason I mention this, you have to, because you don't know what the loam is actually going to be. It can be a man-made loam where the calcium levels are so high that they're higher almost than a regular liming. I've had that happen, 10,000 parts per million calcium. That's why nothing grew on that soil. You can have really poor quality native soils. You don't know, you need to get it tested. Um, I want you to make sure, especially if you're not doing this as a, um, as a, as a uh, profession, that you put the raised beds where you will see them and see them often. Raised beds can turn on a dime and what looks really, really good one day, all of a sudden, next day it's not. You have to be able to see them. They have to be in your line of movement or line of visibility, either from your kitchen sink, your bathroom sink, I don't care where, but you have to be able to see them, okay? Um, and it's a thing that people make that mistake all the time. Here is the, so the beds that I showed you in the first picture, this is us building them. So we had a whole working party and we were teaching how to do this. And so this is a 12 inch high bed and it's kind of hard to see through these pictures, but we built each six inch layer as its own entity. So by the time we had it up to the top, we had a very, very complex food source for our microbes all the way down. And that includes having turned the soil um, underneath. So I had tested the soil underneath where the beds are now and the loam that came in. And um, one of the guys in my group loves um, numbers and he, he worked out every single number. We had it down to the, to the pound of all these things that are here. We measured it all out. You can see us adding stuff. But one of the things I wanted to make sure that you noticed was how much leaf litter in the upper right corner you can see how much leaf is in there. And also what you can't see in this is that there is a 
um, large amount of wood chip in here, old aged wood chip. It's aged a year, doesn't need to be aged more than that. And I want you also to notice that it is mulched and it is mulched all the time. It is never without mulch. Okay, here are the um, ingredients that were in that bed. You don't have to worry about writing it all down. If you get the handout, it's all there. Okay, so you don't have to panic about it. Um, I know this is a lot of writing, but the point is um, you're mixing dry leaves, aged wood chips, um, either homemade compost or bagged compost and your native loam or whatever loam you're buying. And you're mixing that all together. And the one thing in here that's gonna probably throw most of you off sideways is a non-medicated layer mash. So that just means it's chicken food and um, organic ground chicken food is great. I don't use um, organic cause I can't afford it for most of my clients. Um, so I use honestly blue seals, actually I think it's Poulin, um, non-medicated layer mash works incredibly well. If you've never, um, if you feed chickens, a lot of you are gonna have chicken, so that's great. Um, take a look at what your bag um, tag says, and you're gonna be really, really surprised at the um, wonderfully useful mix it is uh, to work with. And what it will do is kick off your bacteria very, very hard and fast. So one of the things to remember about building this kind of a bed is you must give it a minimum of two weeks, preferably six weeks, and ideally you build this in the fall and let the winter cool it down. You will get a very fast, very hot reaction um, when you build this bed. And if you try and plant into that and or seed into that, you will kill off everything you're planting. This is a very dynamic mix, give it time. So the beds that I showed you that we were building, we built those on tax day and we planted on Memorial Day, give or take. And the soil quality was unbelievable. Six weeks later, it was excellent, okay? So raised beds and containers. You notice that there were a lot of um, containers in the, in the Perkins picture. And you'll see other pictures later on in the, in, the, um, in the program where I work with containers a lot. Um, I have a client who had a stroke and so cannot get out into the garden. Everything is up on a deck and that includes all the veggies, all the flowers. He loves hummingbirds. We bring the hummingbirds in. This is how you mix a mix for containers, big containers, whether it's whiskey barrels or the big 14, 16, 18 inch um, uh, plastic containers. I don't really care what you're using. Um, this is the kind of mix you use. And we mix it on huge tarps and go from there. Again, this information is on the handout. Also, um, Doug will put in a link to a quote unquote recipe for a whiskey barrel directly if you're interested in whiskey barrels. One of the interesting things about whiskey barrels is A, they last seven to 10 years. Um, B, um, they can be very good for single species. So you can do four um, peppers in a whiskey barrel and manage them very, very, very well. You can do a one single tomato. You can do four kales. You can do um, a nice um, TP of beans or a nice TP of cucumbers. It would be about two cucumbers. It would be about 12 to 15 beans. So there's lots you can do with a whiskey barrel um, and you don't have to build them, okay? You know, they're just, they're straightforward. If you do decide to use a whiskey barrel, you must drill must drill between the second and first bands, not just on the bottom to get drainage. A lot of people just put drainage on a whiskey barrel underneath, which is great unless it seals against the ground and then you will not get drainage and you will definitely have problems with flood. So, um, or you can put it up slightly on, a, um, on, on two uh, pieces of board, which will allow air underneath so water will drain. Um, so anyways, more on whiskey barrels if anybody has questions. So a lot of people don't actually know what they're actually looking for. What I wanted to show you on the left-hand side, this is what crumb structure looks like when you start to get it right. You can actually see it looks like cake crumbs. And so this is in one of the raised beds, um, not actually the ones I was showing you before, but some, from another set of raised beds. 
and um, you can you can see it fairly clearly. You can also see some pretty decent looking white roots. So you can tell that the plant material itself was actively growing. On the right hand side, this is a, um, a challenge we run every year at our farmer's market. And we give out um, brand new pairs of underwear in July and ask people to bring them back in September. And the proof of how well their gardens grow is can their gardens consume a pair of brand new fresh cotton underwear within two months. And obviously this was our grand prize winner of last, this is last year, believe it or not. So we did do this in 2021. Um, and next year, I want you guys to all plant a pair of underwear and see how long it takes for your soil to actually eat it up. Now, this also shows you something else because it tells you how hungry a soil system can be and how much you need to support it if you really want top quality production. All right, and that also gets lost a lot in containers and raised beds. Before we get a whole lot deeper, I don't care what you're doing, whether it's in ground, whether it's a container, whether it's a raised bed, you must mulch it. And I also don't care what you use. So some of you are gonna have very specific um, restrictions on what you will and won't use, and that's perfectly fine. I, whatever will work for you works for you. I have found up at the greenhouse, so I have a farm, Actually, the picture is actually behind me. We use old rugs. Um, they work incredibly well. They give me about three to four years. And um, as they start to break down and all I have is a nylon backing, then I just roll that up and, um, and dispose of it. So I really don't care what you use. You must cover it with something. Of course, the prettiest things are things like the chopped straw or um, a nice half broken down compost, anything like that, cool. Uh, and for my clients, <laughs> we don't use old rugs. Um, we use whatever is appropriate for them. Plant potentials. Okay, most of you have heard about John Kempf of Advancing Eco Ag. If you haven't, um, I have his link um, further down in the, in the um, program, and you need to get there and take a look at his plant um, health pyramid. It's just, it's really easy to grasp. I'm not gonna go into it here. He does a better job of it. What I do want to say is plants don't lie. They can't. If there is enough energy in the system, then the plant itself will sustain itself. And if there is not enough energy, it will do its level best to reproduce itself and then it will die. All right. If you look around you, plants don't need us to grow. They will adjust what they can do to what they have. One of the reasons so many people have problems with plants is we do all of our growing and all of our thinking about the garden right around the time when we plant them, which is in give or take Memorial Day. Obviously there's um, flex on that. And so we put the, t the time, the money, the energy, the fertilizer, the care in right then. And the plants respond to that and set up a series of expectations for themselves. And then we go away on vacation in July and ignore the garden and the plant goes, well, I started setting up one set of expectations. Those expectations have evaporated. Now, what do I do? And that's when you have the die off in August. And it's a really clear um, story that the plants will tell you and they do it all the time. Okay, so here's the thing. If you are looking for high quality production and this was um, this program is based off of um, trying to grow really high quality fruits and vegetables at this point. Um, by the way, this also works for flower gardens and I have um, seven eighths of my um, clients give a whole lot more care to their flower gardens than they do their vegetable gardens. Um, at Perkins School of the Blind, it was vegetables and flowers. And in my farm, it's veggies, then some flowers. So it, it works back and forth. If you're not stepping in, in a raised bed or a container, if you're not stepping in to support with both foliar and soil drenches by the third week of July, you will lose your quality by Labor Day. Now, if, you, if you're okay with that because you, you're leaving at that point and, and you don't need the production and you don't need to care, then you just let it all fade away and that's okay. But if you expect to have production into the fall, and especially 
mid late September into October, you must step in and support. There is no place for your plants to go. By the end of August, they will have completely used up all the pore spaces in your soil system. And there is, the only thing you can do is, is provide external support to them. Um, and there's just no way around it. Now, I don't know how many of you have noticed that um, it used to be you hit Labor Day and everything would start to trend down. Now, we, are we have definitely gained a solid two, if not three weeks of production into September. And September is now hotter and drier than it used to be. And that's um, definitely a challenge that must be met. So you need to keep that in mind. The gardens that I showed you in the first picture, the tomatoes that are in that garden taste just as good before frost, just before frost, as they do any time in the middle of summer. And I support that garden literally to the week before I know I have a killing frost coming, okay? I'm also trying to make a point. I'm also trying to teach people things, but that's how that garden gets managed. Okay, so most of you have heard about liquid humates at this point. Um, there's also granular humates. A lot of you have heard about biochar. Um, biochar is another form of um, soil carbon. Uh, a lot of you have heard of humus. The point being in a container or a raised bed, no matter how good you are, you are going to run out of carbon. You're gonna run out of that as both as an energy source and as a stabilizing unit. I use liquid humates every single time I either use a foliar or I use a drench from mid July on. The cool thing is I never used to make a big deal out of this because it was impossible to get the liquid humates. Now, um, thank you to the marijuana trade because they figured it out. Um, liquid humates are available all over the place. Um, any place you have a, um, a hydro store or a, um, anybody who's growing marijuana can get you access to liquid humates. And um, the ones I use are from Neptune's Harvest, but I have a wholesale account and that makes it much, much easier for me. But anybody can get humates and a little goes a very long way. So um, in a 50 gallon drum, which is how I do a lot of my um, management, in a 50 gallon drum, you only need a half a cup of liquid humates and you get a big bang for that. That's a lot. It means you can do a half to maybe a teaspoon in a gallon of water and still get a very good result, all right? So you can also add it in granular form, which is the biochar or the leonardite. Um, People want to know, is that the same thing as adding compost? Yes and no in that compost is still carbon. No in that um, biochar and leonardite are much slower um, to break down and it gives you a lot longer carrying capacity in the soil. So I use compost, but I also use um, leonardite. I do not use biochar. I would if I could get it in a cost-effective manner. I really like the concept of biochar, um, especially in the bigger raised beds. Reality for me is that that doesn't become cost effective. I, as I said, I use this on client sites and they get to determine a lot because of what they will pay for and what they won't. And Leonardite is at least affordable. Okay, um, again, all this sort of detail is sitting in the handout, so you don't have to go crazy trying to grab it all. I use soil drenches. Uh, the one I've, I have up here is pretty much what I use. I also have a crate of all sorts of things that goes with me and I've learned through time. So I've been doing this for 40 years, which to me sounds extremely long these days. Um, but so I've gotten so I can get to a site and go, oh, there's a problem. And I will pull out um, a calcium supplement or I'll put, pull out a magnesium supplement, or I will pull out a micro um, mineral supplement. You can add, adapt all of this information, but this basic one, even if you did nothing else but this, would take you through a lot of the problems that you're likely to have. Um, and the quick and easy thing to do is you can use that exact same mix to create a foliar spray and get pretty decent results. 
I will say if you um, want to experiment, you should definitely check out Michael Phillips, um, Michael Phillips's book, because the information in there and the recipes he's come up with, you can adapt um, a lot of that information into vegetable gardens. Uh, it's the holistic orchard book that you're looking for, but it is definitely worth taking a look at. One problem with foliar sprays, and this is a real problem for me um, as a person who's on different sites, you need either a misty, moisty day or sun up or sundown. Sundown is fantastic. I'm not gonna show up at sundown on a client site. So I have to sort of wait for the misty, moisty days. And then I run around like an idiot trying to get it all sprayed while I still have capacity for uptake, all right? The stomata need to be open. The sun needs to not be burning off the microbes as you apply them, okay? I have two custom mineral mixes and these are things that I've worked out through time. Obviously you need to adapt them to your own um, uh, working spaces, but I'm gonna walk you through them. This one I am gonna actually read to you. So, and by the way, on a dry day, it mean I mean it. If you get this wet and you try and store it, you will hate everything about it. This is extraordinarily biologically active and it will smell like a septic tank if you get it wet. And I've done that and it's really not fun. So one part azomite or dynamite, what you want is a paramagnetic clay. For some of you, I know some people are, who are on the call are not from New England, but if you are from Massachusetts, the Mount Tom basalt is also a paramagnetic, um, in this case, stone dust. And I don't care what you use, but paramagnetics is worth looking into. I'm not gonna spend, I'm not, this is not the time to go through paramagnetics, but you want a paramagnetic element to this mix. It definitely helps with uptake. You want one part of slow stable carbon, which can be leonardite, biochar, or if you can come up with something else, that's okay too. I use North Country Organics Pro Grow. There are other blended mineral fertilizers out there. I like their product the best. I think it's the best quality one that's out there. Um, uh, plant tone, um, Aspoma's plant tone is something you can look at. I know Bionutrient Food Association had their spring blend. Um, there's a bunch of different ways you can go with this. I'm just showing you what I've done. And then two parts alfalfa meal. Here's the interesting thing. I don't know how many of you have ever worked with alfalfa meal, but alfalfa meal, if you take nothing else out of this workshop, use alfalfa meal. It is by far the most useful uh, product and it's alfalfa meal, not alfalfa pellets, okay? Um, if you can't get alfalfa meal, then you don't use alfalfa in this, but when you go to work it into a garden, you take alfalfa cubes, which are horse food, and you soak them in water um, in a trash barrel, okay? And then you apply that slurry, working this rest of this mix in at the same time, okay? So alfalfa meal adds both a bacterial food and a fungal food in a way that almost nothing else does. Okay, oops, I think I went past. Yeah, winter mix. So the spring mix is the one I use in the beginning of the season. This is the mix that I work in in the fall. Um, and this one gets used at a much lighter weight. And you'll see it's largely a calcium um, uh, support. And this is where you can add the local stone dust, which will give you a different um, look at uh, mineralization. So this one, again, do not get it wet. And you'll notice again that the chicken feed is here. Chicken feed is not in the spring one on purpose because I don't wanna worry about heating, but in this winter one, I don't mind if it heats because there's plenty, plenty of time. You notice in the notes, it says cover with mulch and because you're only gonna chop it in. One of the things that happens is that we have a great desire to turn everything and get it looking neat and tidy. And that's actually not particularly helpful to the soil system. So you're going to chop this in and then you're gonna cover it over. 
And that's what's going to um, give you the what you're going to be looking at. So if you look at this, um, a lot of people try and pull the dead plants out. You don't want to, especially out of containers, but even out of your raised beds. You cut the plants off and you just let the plants go, planters go fallow. Okay, you spread the winter mix on top and you chop it in lightly and cover it with mulch. In the spring, you will be able to pull out all the nodules of the root systems that are left and that will give you 90% of your bacteria will have just held on in your fungi. If, you, if you're in a raised bed, you'll have some fungi. If you're in a container, you'll have very little. Um, but most of your microbes will feed on those old decaying root systems through the winter and then you'll go ahead and start the system up again in the spring. And this is what it looks like. This is not a raised bed, but this is the only picture I could come up with of the stuff that I'd taken pictures of. So you see, I use this tool by the hour. This is a um, tomato, a potato fork or um, a refuse fork. Uh, I call it a cultivator. And you can see the layer that goes down and it's literally a chop, 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 chop action. And you want to still be able to see the pieces, the, 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 um, Minerals will flow down along the fork, um, the, the tines as they go in. And that's how you're gonna get distribution down through two to three inches. And it really does uh, make a difference to your long-term uh, success. I use it a lot. I wanted to put this picture in because you can see um, the heavy, heavy, heavy roots. This is, I'm gonna show you a culture bed in a minute, which is another way of doing a raised bed. This came out of one of our hookah cultures here at the farm. And I wanted to show you the quality of the root system. You can see right in front of Lisa's hand, the, um, the remnants of the original transplant, but look at the diameter and strength of the root system that thrust out from that. And that's what you're really, really looking to do all the time, okay? So it's worth trying to get it right. Every time you clean out a bed and you're actually removing roots, take a look at what the root system's telling you. The roots will tell you a huge amount uh, about the quality of the, the garden that you're, you're producing. Okay, so this picture is obviously not vegetables, but what I want to do is show you that there's a tree turning in the background so you were looking at an early October picture and I wanted to show you the quality of the flowers that are in this picture. This is the client who um, uh, has a stroke and can only get out on his deck. And uh, you can see these are all um, plants designed to bring in the hummingbirds because his chair is just off to the um, side over here. But I wanted to show you what managing the fertilizer can do to the quality of the picture that you can see. Now, if these were tomatoes, they would still be tasting excellent, okay? I also wanna point out that you're gonna make mistakes. All of you already know that. And the trick isn't to get hung on the mistakes. The trick is to say, huh, what just happened? Oh, okay, we just had a major rain event or we had a major drought. One of the other things that's starting to happen, I'm sure you guys are aware of it, um, we're getting a, well, everybody knows about climate change and weather interruptions. We are getting very, very, very intensely dry air coming down Canadian highs in the middle of summer. Um, and they can come and we'll have dew points, you know, 40 degrees, 30 degrees. Those are phenomenal to work in. There's no question. They are really tough on your plants and they're really, really tough on your container and uh, raised bed plants because they can't suck up enough water through um, their completely constricted root systems at the end of the season to be able to sustain themselves. So you have to step in at that point. Um, and I, I adjust, I adjust how much they get fed um, and how much they, how much water they get depending upon what kind of weather pattern we've got. So uh, keep that in mind as you're, as you're going through. 
I wanted to take you through a fair number of different kinds of resources. And um, I don't know if all the pictures are visible from where you guys are, but any one of these is a way to start twisting how you think. And for my money, it's every one of your yards, every one of your farms, every one of your um, growing situations has its own story. Yes, it's attached to a wider ecosystem, but it is very specifically attached to your, um, your use of the yard. So you want to take the time to figure out what your yard can do for you and then how you need to step in on your own and help it do what you want it to do. Um, our farm here is a very old uh, farm. I, I've, it actually comes down through the family all the way from the 1700s. It's gray pods old clay, which if anybody knows what gray pods old clay is, it has virtually nothing in it. When we tested it, it was 5.2 pH, no calcium, no magnesium, no phosphorus, um, no potassium, no nothing. And I took one look at that and said, I'm not gonna take the time, the money to build up the soils. I grew up, we moved everything up. So we have raised beds on anything that we're growing. And uh, that's for us was, was the good decision to make. We get huge amounts of production out of the beds we've made. And I think that's by far the better use of time for us. This is what a hugel culture bed can do. In 2008, so that's our house in the background in the middle picture. And so this is one of the fields that um, has nothing in it, if you test the soil. And in 2008, we had a massive ice storm here and literally every canopy shattered and we, we drowned in wood. This is some of the remnants of it. And so I looked around to try and find out something constructive to do with it and came up with the, this was hugel cultures before hugel cultures were hot. Right now, they're one of the things everybody likes to play with. Um, they're amazingly effective at buffering flood and drought. So the two things that are gonna hammer at us through time are pulsing water systems. When the rains come, they're gonna come with a vengeance and you're gonna get two, three inches of rain at a time. That's enough to shut down a soil system. When the droughts come, you're looking at six to eight weeks without rain, sometimes 10 to 12, sometimes longer. Once these beds are set and functioning, you can go easily two and a half months without watering once the plants are established. And I've had water halfway up these logs from a flood event and the top crowns where the plants were, were completely stable. And as soon as the bed started to drain out, everything just settled right back down. I'm not saying I didn't support at that point, I did, but you can see the volume um, and the quality of the plants that grow onto these hula culture beds. Um, this is a book that my sister and I put together um, because we do so much with raised beds. And so if you are curious, that's on our website, which is greeneryinmotion.com. And there's a couple of other things on the um, website if you are curious about that. And then these are um, four of what I consider to be the best um, links that are out there for um, getting more information. Uh, Advancing Eco Ag, Acres USA, Bionutrient Food Association, and Agrodynamics. I use products from um, Advancing Eco Ag and Agrodynamics. I've been a subscriber to Acres for 40 years. And um, the BFA, um, I don't know if Dan's still doing the training program or not, um, but at one point had an outstanding training program. Thanks everyone for all the questions coming into the chat. Um, let me go over it there. We have a lot coming in, so we won't exactly uh, read all of them verbatim, but what I'll do is, is we have uh, some categories laid out for you. Okay, that the, works. The first, I think we'll start with some construction questions. Okay. The first one, um, 
what are some of your preferred construction materials uh, as far as for the, the container itself? Which is a really interesting question. Um, it's adaptable. So the raised beds that I showed you at the beginning, um, those are white oak, uh, almost impossible to get. I happen to be really lucky because um, one of our local um, farmers has a sawmill and he put together some white oak beds for us. They will last about 15 years before I have to worry about them breaking down. Um, that's the ideal set of circumstances. You can use concrete blocks. You can um, use, well, you have to be careful with pressure treated. Everybody knows that. Um, honestly, what I've done at home is I've used pine. You'll get about three to five years out of pine. And then what I've been able to do is to just merge them and let them soften as the pine breaks down. I just feed it into the system and um, recage them with fresh pine. So it's cheap, it's fast, and that's what I end up doing. I agree that that won't work for everybody. You can use cedar, you can use steel. Um, I will say that um, Gardner Supply Company in uh, Vermont has a huge catalog of options available. And one thing about Perkins School for the Blind, um, that's one of the reasons why I brought up the whiskey barrels. The whiskey barrels will give you seven to 10 years. They are oak, they are charred on the inside, um, and they will work extraordinarily well. We've used a fair amount of plywood um, at Perkins, and that works pretty well too. We've used cedar, we've used, um, we've used a, a lot of pine, um, and then that gets expensive because you got to repair it, uh, but we have used it. Um, I would say it, uh, I've used a lot of plastic, um, not necessarily for, for the four by eight square um, raised beds, okay, but I use a lot of plastic. I don't know um, if people have um, heard of Ocean State, but Ocean State Job Lot has this phenomenal thing in the spring where the pots are unbelievably cheap and you can get really big pots. And that's what we do um, for clients. I use old nursery containers. Um, because I'm a garden uh, landscaper, I have tree installations. If anybody lives in and around here, um, so I'm in Westminster, Massachusetts, I have some very nice large plastic um, nursery cans. They're black, um, but they will last you years and years and years and years. And they grow phenomenal peppers, eggplants. You wouldn't believe what we can grow in those. Um, I should have actually put some of those pictures in. Didn't think of it. Uh, so I adapt as much as I can. You can use old logs. Um, so if you take a look at the hugel culture pictures, you can just you could blow that out and use some of those as edges, and then leave them exposed with the uh, mix in the in interior of that. For me, I wanted that water holding capacity as the fungi um, knit through that decaying wood. I wanted that kind of a buffer. So. I didn't go that route. Um, does, is that enough of yeah. an answer, Doug? That's great. Yeah, there's a couple of people who are asking specifically about um, what is the concern with pressure treated wood? And then on that, could you also talk a little bit about using pallets, old wooden pallets? Would there be some uses for those? Okay, yeah, actually you can definitely use the old pallets. Um, the problem with those is they're actually gonna create a very big raised bed for you. Um, in the back um, or in the bottom of two of my uh, HKs, we uh, actually put pallets and, and then filled up the slats with extra woody debris from the farm. So yes, um, I have no problems at all using um, pallets and the staples break down surprisingly fast. So that's cool. If you're using them to go up um, like a raised bed, that's a very tall raised bed and it's gonna cost you an arm and a leg to fill it. Um, so that would not be a top use, I wouldn't think, for it, but I wouldn't have an objection to it. Um, the pressure treated, you just have to, it depends on where your tolerances are. Um, because if, if it's pressure treated, it is, it is designed not to break down and it has um, materials pushed into the wood that will stop fungal activity. Great. 
accept that you want fungal activity slowly working in your, especially in the raised beds that are four by eights or bigger. Okay, so it sort of defeats the purpose of having a functional soil system if you're putting in a, um, a fungal inhibitor. Now, having said that, one of the ways you can work with pine is to coat the inside of it with copper, which is a fungal inhibitor and it does slow it down. Um, so again, trade-offs, depends on where your tolerances are. Great question. I think we'll move on um, again in construction. Are you adding any liners to, uh, or barriers to your beds when you're building them? Welcome to the rodent problem. Um, we haven't had to in most of the sites that I'm working on. Having said that, if you're going to do it, the time to do it is before you fill the freaking thing and use heavy duty hardware cloth. If you don't use heavy duty hardware cloth, they will come through, the voles will come through. And as soon as the voles come in through, it doesn't take long for a chippy to come in behind it. So you want heavy duty hardware cloth and you want it galvanized. It still won't last forever, but it gives you a shot at it. Um, otherwise they're coming right through. And if you know you have a real heavy duty problem, you may want to talk to an exterminator. Um, you may want to get a cat. You may want to get a Jack Russell Terrier. Um, if there's ever a use for the, the entire Terrier clan of dogs was bred to work the farms to reduce the rodent populations, which is phenomenal. If you happen to have a Jack Russell, um, they will take care of the problem for you. Um, otherwise get a friend, borrow one, keep it for a week, you'll also deal with the problem. Either way, either use heavy duty galvanized or control the rodents. There's not an easy answer to that one and nobody has an easy answer. Mm -hmm. There are a couple questions uh, about dimensions of your beds. Um, in particular, are the depth of soil that we're, you know, ideally having to grow most of the vegetables we're thinking of, um, what's the ideal depth, um, and, and that sort of thing. Okay, so that's actually an interesting question, and I had taken out all those slides because I was terrified I was going to go over time on this thing. So um, that's what's also in the book is a whole talk on that. Four by eight is the standard because um, so much of the building trades are based on eight foot lengths of things. And four by eight turns out to be a pretty useful um, width and depth or width and length for people because you can weed it in about 15 minutes. And almost everybody has 15 minutes to get one bed under control. And then the next time you have time, you do the next bed. So um, I use that four by eight a lot. Having said that, um, the HK beds are um, 80 feet long and um, every 20 feet I have a break where nothing gets planted and I just create a cross through. Um, if anybody's really interested, um, I don't have any of the numbers right in front of me, but Will Bonesell um, came up with a whole approach to how to do it with Rick because he's up in Maine. Everything he does is on raised beds and uh, he's got it down to a very, very nice way of looking at it. Um, I probably should have left those slides in. <sighs> um, so yeah, as far as depth, I like 12 inches. If I'm, if I'm gonna bother to do a raised bed, I'm gonna do 12 inches. You can get away with six, provided you can work the soil underneath. Okay, if you can't work the soil underneath, if you're sitting on hot top, if you're sitting on concrete, if you're sitting on soil that you have to seal because it's contaminated, then you've got to at minimum go up 12 inches. If you're on one of those situations, I highly recommend you think about 18 inches. So one of my sites, um, years ago was on a nursing home, a nursing home, and we built four foot beds um, so that people could stand at them. And um, it was part of the um, physical therapy for them, but it also worked. Um, the soil grew anything we wanted it to grow. Uh, so you can, you can do it as, as deep as you want, provided that you have built in um, carbon all the way down to the bottom. If you don't, you're gonna have a compaction problem. You won't, you won't be able to win. It'll be no different and no better than um, being in ground with a um, 
hard pan problem because you will have a hard pan problem. So I like 12 inches. I like four by eight. Um, but that is again, personal preference. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that you just uh, segued perfectly into um, a question from Charles specifically about the stand up size raised beds. Um, and someone else asked about the beds that you might see on stilts. Are there any considerations, any special considerations on something that is completely off the ground? Yeah, so we use those all the time at Perkins School for the Blind because you got to be able to pull the wheelchairs underneath. So if you're doing a pull under bed, which is how I um, term them, if you use a pull under bed, then they're a six inch depth of, and this is so you would go back and look at the container mix, not the raised bed mix, okay? Because you can't put the weight of the raised bed mix into these um, pull under beds, or you will end up breaking them apart really, really easy uh, earlier. What you want is the container mix in a six inch um, depth, and that will grow you lettuces. It will grow you some of your bigger greens, like a chard. Um, it will do some very nice herbs. It will do you strawberries. It will do um, parsleys, cilantros, thymes, um, rosemaries up to a certain point. So the pull under beds have uses, but they are limited. Um, we did one pull under bed that was a 10 inch board. And it, what happens is if you can stand at it, no problems because your hand can reach in. But the pull under part of it, it was too high. There was too much wood in between. So it didn't work. You couldn't, you couldn't make it work. So I strongly suggest if you're working with this as an accessibility issue, that you restrain yourself to six inches in height um, and then work with the plants that can grow in that kind of a limited space. Okay. So um, does that answer the question? Yeah, we're, we're going to jump into, there's several questions about hugo culture. In, okay. In a couple, one specific one was, uh, would you use aged chips and how aged um, wood chips would you use? And could you describe a little bit, uh, again, the, the layering system of hugo culture? Okay, hugo culture is an entirely different kind of raised bed. So, um, the biggest and heaviest and oldest um, wood that you have on your property. And it, so, and I, you saw the pictures of the, of the logs we had after the ice storm. We've since built a bunch of different hugo culture beds and some of them are built on old cordwood. So that tells you that it doesn't have to be super big, you know, 10 inch diameter logs. You want the biggest, heaviest wood you can at the bottom. And you want a pretty good layer of it. I want that if I'm making one for me, I want that to be a minimum of 12 inches deep. Okay, and that's just straight wood. Onto that wood, you are going to sprinkle dolomite lime. Okay, this is one of the few times when you're gonna use dolomite lime. So this is a calcium and magnesium source and fungi in a system help to hold calcium in place. So this is where you want your extra calcium to go because as those fungi start to break down that wood, they are going to catch and hold the calcium and keep it available. And as you build this, what you're doing is building a connective system of wood fiber that comes all the way up through to the top. Um, and I'm, there's a whole bunch of stuff on the web, on my website about hugo culture, which shows you more pictures and it gives you the whole, um, pattern. Do you want me to go through the whole pattern, Doug? I, it's easy to, to walk through it. I, I don't know how much you want to. I think if folks are interested and we have some time. Let's, let's go through that. Okay. So there won't be any pictures, but I'll walk you through it. So we have a dairy goat herd and I manage that herd at the same level I manage all the plants. So they are an extremely healthy herd. So that means their manure is extremely quali high quality. So what we do is the wood goes down the lime goes down, fresh raw manure goes down. So this is not compost that's going down on top of the heavy wood. 
this is raw manure. This is how I'm working this. Okay, then another layer of wood goes on. On top, and then that one is at least six inches deep. So now if you're keeping track in your head, you're going to have this big heavy wood pile, which has, I work in um, the manure so that it's filling in all the cracks. So I haven't actually added a whole lot of height when I've added my raw manure. I then add another six inches of wood. And I really don't care what kind of wood that is. So I prune um, for clients. So I have a prune pile um, and there's always widow makers hanging around. I mean, there's always wood on this, on this farm. So getting the wood is not a problem. And so another six inches goes down. Onto that goes another layer of dolomite. Okay, calcium and magnesium. Again, it's onto a wood layer. On top of that goes composted um, manures. So one thing about using manures, and some of you will have manures and some of you will not, if you are using manure, you are immediately adding nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium. That's one of the huge advantages of using manures. So if you are not using the manures, then you're going to have to come up with another source of organic material that can buffer and support the um, breakdown of your wood. So for most people, that's compost or a purchased load of um, manure, one way or the other. Um, you need something along those lines to, to aid in the situation. So now we're onto our compost layer on top of the wood. And at that point, um, you're going to add a layer of topsoil. So um, I have a local source of topsoil that comes in um, whenever I'm doing a whole bunch of hookah cultures. And um, I know what it is. I know the company, it gets tested the loam goes down. I then mix into that loam, whatever minerals are, mix, uh, are missing. And so if I'm not 100% certain, um, for most of you, I would be using the winter mix. So we just finished rebuilding. Um, in fact, some of the people on the call um, tonight were here for the um, Hula Culture Project this, this fall. And I just went ahead and made up winter mix and worked the winter mix right into the loam. And winter mix works phenomenally well in the top layer of a um, fall built uh, hula culture. And then you mulch it, okay? And you mulch it and you mulch it and you mulch it. So we have um, a couple of uh, neighborhood um, landscapers who drop off their leaves. And I literally just pile the leaves on the thing and then um, hope that there's a rain that will settle everything down. And if not, they blow off and I add more. Um, old hay works. Um, we actually, uh, not in the field that the HKs are in, but the horse field, which is next door, um, we'll run the um, lawnmower with the bagger around and literally just pull in whatever um, wild grasses are there. I don't really care. Again, as I said earlier, I don't care what the mulch is. I want that top loam covered. And then it sits there. So it's sitting out there right now under about six to eight inches of leaves because we lucked out, the rains came, it settled it, and then it froze it, it was perfect. So by the time next spring comes, it's gonna have packed down. Um, when I'm finished with a rebuild or a building of an HK bed, it is about 18 inches high. So it comes up to just about your knee. And in that first year, it will drop about six inches. When we rebuilt the HK, so we rebuilt HK1, they all have names. Um, and it was 10 years old. It was the first one we built after the ice storm. And it had broken all the way down. So 18 inches worth of organic material had broken down to maybe three inches above grade. Okay, that's how much the system had consumed itself. This first year, of the rebuild, it is going to grow two things. It's gonna grow potatoes and it's gonna grow squashes because potatoes and squashes can handle that really wild, wicked energy of a newly developing HK bed. Once the HK bed stabilizes, you will get the best tasting onions you've ever had in your life. And once they get really um, settled out and for us, um, We'll put manure on at about every three years, they get top dressed. So we have 
you know, I never thought to count. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven. We have 12 sets of raised beds here, of which eight of those are HKs. So we rotate um, cleanouts um, around. So not everything gets the same um, every year. So you kind of have to keep a track of it. I have a farm diary um, where I keep track of HK1 got X, HK2 got Y. Um, we planted HK2 with X, Y, Z this year. One of the things that will be fascinating if you decide to try this, um, I don't know how many of you have noticed that different plants produce different quality soils underneath themselves. And it's really, really interesting to grow a batch of potatoes in an HK and a batch of squashes. And at the end of the season, um, you take a look at the differences in the soil and they are different. And you're going, oh, now I can see why you might wanna do a diversity thing here. If I, cause look at the two different qualities of soil. Anyway, it's, it's an interesting um, study if you haven't had a chance to try it and you really should try it. So that's the basics of an HK. I'm happy to answer more specific questions. I think that's good for now. We're going to move on to some of the sort of maintenance questions. And you mentioned mulch a lot. And a couple of people were talking in the chat uh, about different kinds, types of mulch, seaweed in particular, um, yep. grass clippings, yep. um, and ways to you know use mulch, manage mulch in, in a way that isn't sort of also getting in the way too, too obstructive to what you're trying to do. So, whoa, okay. Um, so that is actually one of the interesting things. I actually like grass clippings. What we've discovered is that um, if you cut the grass, leave it for a day and go back and recut, you'll get a mixture of, um, especially if you do it on a dry, in a dry period, you'll be semi hay-like if so, if you cut it and leave it to dry and then go back and bag it, you'll get a very fine, but fairly easy to work with mix. And we use that trick all on the farm all the time because it's dry enough that, it, so if you're, doing, if you're doing a fresh grass, like if you look at behind me and I'm looking at the grass, the reason that looks so bright green right now is that exactly what I'm telling you is how that field gets managed. It gets mowed um, without bagging, dried for at least a day, if not two, then it gets mowed with a bagger and we pick up everything. And that gives you a very fine mix that you can work into anything. And that includes your onions and your garlics and things like that. So I use that all the time. On client sites, I use chop straw all the time. Um, and you can get the tacky mix if you've got, so I've got some sites where it cannot blow for love nor money. It must stay neat and tidy. Fine, then I use the chop. Um, straw with the tacky. If I'm on a site where it's not as critical, I use the chop straw without the tack. Um, again, I adapt depending upon what's going on. Um, you can use, so um, Brian O'Hara uses a three quarter um, cooked um, compost and he works that in as his mulch slash compost layer. Um, that works for me too. I don't have that kind of time um, to manage that and nor do I have the equipment. So, and it comes down to what kind of equipment you have, what kind of manual dexterity you have, what kind of help you've got. Um, often my nephew helps me and it's gotta be really straightforward and basic cause um, this is not what he wants to be doing um, but he needs money. So, you know, things like that matter too. Um, and I flex whatever needs to be flexed. I will say this much. If you've got a whole wild edge and you can get it before it flowers, you will find that your weeds have a huge beneficial value to your gardens if you will use them as a mulch. Um, and very often, you can't, actually in the background picture here, I will take a string trimmer um, before they start to flower uh, because I want the flowers later on for the late pollinators. So I will go through at half height here and take all these, dry them, and then use them as green, um, green and drying um, mulches, which will force all of my um, uh, perennial flowers, uh, this is goldenrods and things like that in the back, to reset and bloom 
By that point, you get a slightly later feed for your beneficials and you have a better chance of having a higher nectar content in the flowers because they're not supporting these huge stalks. Um, we're very often getting heavy duty drought now in August and September, which is really hammering the, um, the beneficials. So um, it's, it's a way of managing things. Is that enough of an answer? Yeah. And a couple of more questions as we're on mulch still. Um, pine needles, what are your thoughts about pine needles as mulch and wood chips as a mulch layer? What are your thoughts about that? Wood chips as a mulch layer, if they have already started to break down, fine. If they have not and they are brand new, fresh and raw, um, work a whole lot of um, alfalfa meal in and it will speed up the fungal activity and provide some of the extra nitrogen that's needed. And I've done that and gotten away with it and it works. Okay, but if you don't do that step, you will find yourself, um, I learned that the hard way. We, long boring story, I won't tell it. Um, suffice it to say, if you don't put in a, um, a nitrogen source for the raw wood chip and it's mulch, you're gonna be in trouble. Okay, so just alfalfa meals is a wonderful thing to fall back on. Um, pine needles, I have no problems with pine needles. My big problem with pine needles, it's very hard to get enough. They don't hold a lot of water. Um, so you need to have a fair amount of them. If you do, um, not to worry. They have done studies now on both oak and pine where everybody thinks they're gonna break down and um, create an acid um, situation in your soil and they don't. Um, and if you, for any reason, think that is a huge issue, you run a little bit of aragonite over it. You run a little calcite over it and you don't worry about it. I have no problems with pine needles. In fact, one of the big batches of leaves that comes in always comes in with pine needles. And I actually like that. Um, I use them up um, uh, in the onion beds because I like the fact that I can maneuver it very easily in and around the onions. Mm -hmm. And a couple more folks have asked again about seaweed. Is there any particular um, you know, concerns about where we source seaweed or uh, salt building up in our soil? Um, I live inland, so I don't have a whole lot of experience with seaweed. I would have no problems at all with a annual application of fairly heavy application of seaweed. Um, if you're worried about the salt, um, bring it home, run it through a tub of um, water, pull off some of the extra sodium. Um, but the seaweed in and of itself, you can use kelp and which of course is a seaweed and it has a sodium component. You can use salt water um, on gardens. And especially if you have a low bat soil battery, um, which a, a lot of people can end up with, especially if you're in a flood event, um, then it, it can actually use salt. So no, that, that in itself, does, and once a year, I would kill for it, but I'm not trucking out to the coast to get it. So I'm not gonna do that, but I, I have no problems with it. Great. We're gonna um, talk a little bit about maintenance. So. Some folks have asked about their existing beds, and as you've predicted, they have some compaction issues. So are there ways that we can ameliorate that, uh, that symptom of perhaps low organic matter soil? The only way I know to do it for real is you have to dismantle the bed and start over, and it's a bore, and I totally get it. Um, you can, it depends on how, how bad the situation is to start with. I've worked with some that you can, that are almost okay and you can go back in and use a rototiller work in your um your slow carbon um and your wood chip and things like that and and get it to start to turn for you some of the soils that people get to start with are pretty bad and honestly it's a bore dig it out drop it on a tarp start from scratch build the right way if you want long-term success with the bed Otherwise, you're just going to be fighting it all the time. So, no, I don't have an easy answer for that. Do you use cover crops in any of your raised beds? Okay, lovely question. Love that question. I have had this conversation with so many different people. No, I don't use cover crops. I know cover crops are so hot right now, you can't even touch them. I think they're fantastic. For broad acre crops, go for it. For big field applications, absolutely. Okay. In a raised bed, the only way you're going to deal with it, okay, you can you can use them if you are doing um, winter kill ones. So if you're doing an oat 
peat, okay, that's great. It becomes a, uh, an active mulch over the winter, no problems. I would rather leave the very healthy growing, uh, the roots of what you grew and let the microbes feed on that and as opposed to adding something else. That makes me atypical at the moment. Um, seriously, I, I totally understand the appeal of the, um, of the cover crops and in any in-ground situation on a wide scale, I would totally be interested in using that. In fact, I work with a couple of um, uh, different operations where we do use cover crops, but in a raised bed, no. Um, in HK beds, no. In containers, why? Um, so no, um, and yes, I'm opinionated on that, but I've tried them and it's just, it's a maintenance headache for not, what I can see is not much gain. So no, I'm not, into, I'm not a cover crop person, not in my world. Mm -hmm. Great. Um, there, again, on the maintenance part, um, a couple of folks have asked about your, you know, watering techniques. Is there a way that you, you know, keep your gardens watered well throughout the season? Yeah, you use irrigation. Um, it's the only thing you can do. And the um, uh, there are so many easy to, to, to use irrigation plans. You don't have to hire a company to put in irrigation. You need to get water to the garden um, and then you can build it. And I've built many in irrigation. Um, you can do it out of circle hoses and um, hose repair pieces and um, simple timers and um, y and four-way ex extenders. You can also, um, Gardener Supply Company has a wonderful array of very nice, more expensive, but um, pretty, prettier sets. But I absolutely set up irrigation for them. You have to, and you have to be able to tweak it. Um, because, so say we end up, and this has now happened, in June, you get three weeks of rain wow, what a misery that is. And you've got young plants and they don't have enough root system underneath them and you're gonna to have to babysit them and you're gonna to have to get the water out of there. And okay, so you shut off all the irrigation, great. Um, but then you get to the end of August and you end up needing to irrigate every second or third day, even in a decently um, sized bed, just because the weather conditions are so severe. So you gotta be able to tweak it. And it can be really simple. It doesn't have to be fancy. It can be literally, at Perkins School for the Blind, we cut pieces of soaker hose, put um, a hose and repair pieces on the ends and put them in, use clips and attach pieces of hose, then pieces of soaker hose, pieces of hose, pieces of soaker hose, put it on a timer. It doesn't have to be fancy. You mentioned rain, and someone asked about protecting our beds from overwatering. Um, is, do you ever cover your beds if you're anticipating a, a really heavy rain? No, it's an interesting. It, it because the flood events are starting to be more of a of a drama. I would rather have the soil structure such that it will manage it and handle it, and so that's what I work on. Now, as I mentioned when we were talking about whiskey barrels. Um, anytime I'm doing a whiskey barrel, I have a series of five holes um, between the first and second bands. You must do that on a whiskey barrel. Um, on the beds, like the ones that I showed you um, that are at the library, those are on an actively open soil system underneath. There's no way that could be flooded out. Okay, so um, I'm not worried about that there. I have worked with raised beds on concrete um, you create a series of half moons at the, on the base of it. So when you get a heavy rain, the water comes through and oozes out. Okay, so yes, you can, you can actually create drainage in raised beds. Now those were cedar plank beds um, coming down onto straight concrete. And we just literally cut half moons every, I think it was every 18 inches. Um, and in hindsight, I probably would have done every 12 based on the problems we had up in the bed. But um, every 12 to 18 inches, you just do a half moon, um, which is wide enough that uh, water can seep through. So yes, um, I would rather uh, do that than cover them because plants love fresh rain. And when the biggest problem, actually I should have put this in the slides too, I pulled it out. 
a lot of you, when you're dealing with raised beds, you're dealing with irrigation coming off of house situations. And a lot of that means um, town water supplies, which means you're dealing with chlorine or chloramine. And what you're doing is you're flooding the bed with an antibacterial agent. And so you have no choice um, and, the, and the plants need water. So you're going to do that. If you get the chance, you can, um, you know, you can buy equipment. Again, all the hydro stores have um, the units that you can run water through that will pull out the chloramine the chlor uh, or the chlorine or any of the other um, water conditioners. They're expensive, but they do work. You can leave, if it's chlorine, you can leave it to outgas for three to four days in a, in a barrel. If it's chloramine, that won't work. Um, so here's the point. With the rains, you're getting totally clean water proportionately. And if you know you're dealing with um, town water supply, you want to use that um, fresh water coming out and get your microbes in up at the top and let it all rinse down and through. Um, let the um, plants bathe in the clean water. So no, I don't cap the beds. I will deal with water problems other ways. And I do, um, depending upon what, what my baseline situation is. I've had standing water in the field with the HK beds. And because the HK beds are built up enough, the crowns of the plants are fine. And as long as your crowns are functioning, they will respond very quickly as the, as the floodwaters um, uh, pull back. So not saying you don't have to pay attention, you do, but that probably is a little too strong. Sure. And Faith brought up a, a point about rain barrels. If you are able to yeah. capture the rainwater, that sounds like a great solution. It does make sure if you're going to use a rain barrel, a couple of things. Um, one, get a sump pump if they're any distance and you have to haul it. Boy, it doesn't take long before that turns into old. And two, please put screening over the top of them or you are going to breed more mosquitoes than you can freaking shake a stick at. Um, and it's not worth it. Mm -hmm. Just FYI. Great. Um, so moving on to some tips and tricks that you might have for preventing our, uh, you know, our animal friends and, and neighbors from eating all of our delicious produce, in particular rabbits, chipmunks, <laughs> deer. Yeah, for us, it's porcupines. Um, that's our biggest problem, trap. There are no easy answers. The biggest problem, the biggest solution to all of the um, problems that everybody's going to be having are to up your predators. A lot of you are in positions where the predators are not appropriate. So, um, you know, foxes don't actually particularly work well in and around humans. They, they don't adapt well. Coyotes do, but unfortunately they also eat cats and small dogs. So we don't like cats and small dogs being consumed, but we would really like it if they would catch every rabbit and every, ch and every chipmunk. Okay, so trade-off city here. Again, there's no easy answer. Um, repellents work surprisingly well um, if you are vigilant. So I can stop rabbits from eating and I can stop deer from, so most of you know that deer absolutely love, passionately love tulip flowers. No, tulip flowers are not edible for humans. On the other hand, if you're dealing with clients in their gardens, they like tulips. You can stop deer from eating tulip flowers by getting out there um, with something called liquid fence and spraying them literally as the flower buds are, um, are opening. And because we're not eating them, it doesn't matter what we're spraying on them and it works a treat, okay? You can put, um, you can spray the overall environment with liquid fence and it will work surprisingly well for rabbits. What I would suggest is you leave a section which has clovers and other things that they like unsprayed so that you are giving them a food source away from what you wanna try and protect. And you can, got, so we have, case in point, we have an incredible problem with English sparrows in the barn right now. So we raise ducks for, for eggs and slug control. Um, fantastic. Guess what we got? We got English sparrows who happen, interestingly enough, to be birds who like to eat bird food, which is what we're feeding the ducks. So we have the ducks netted off, but we now have an English sparrow problem. So what can you do about it? For right now, we're feeding them outside of our main working area and it's working a treat. They go down, 
bottom end of the barn, they get fed. As soon as we get to food supply outside, we're shutting off all food in the barn. We're ne we've netted everything and we'll shut off all the food supply, driving them out of the barn. And then as winter comes on, we're going to re-secure everything and try desperately hard not to let them back in the barn, okay? Um, we have a lot of building going on. In, in this picture that you're looking at right through those tree lines now, you wouldn't see it the way it looks like right now because that lot was sold, $220,000. Uh, 4,000 foot square foot house is going in right behind that greenhouse. Because of that, we've now had um, rats and quite a few things now moving across our property because you can't disrupt um, their housing and they're going to try and survive. So they've now moved into the barn. So I'm now trapping rats. I feel very bad for the rats. I wish it didn't have to happen. I can't allow the rats to be in the barn. Um, so I'm trapping. That's all, there are no easy answers to excess animals. Anything you catch and kill, i.e. Um, mice, chipmunks, rats, if you find a spot on your property where you can drop them, the other um, scavengers will come and clean it up for you in 24 hours. We always drop the kills in two spots and the next day they're gone, okay? Whether it's possums, whether it's coyote, I don't really care. It takes care of the problem and we're um, getting some benefit out of the fact that we have no choice but to remove them. Again, not a happy set of circumstances, but I don't know what else to tell you. I think the, a similar sentiment for groundhogs uh, comes up in, I think, trapping, removing. Sometimes that just doesn't work. And, and yeah, there's no, no good answers. Yeah. Um, I think we can sort of wrap up. Maybe one more question. And... Oh, God, I didn't even watch the time. OK, <laughs> wow. I'm, I'm actually just watching you in the corner. We, uh, the question came in about um, when we're building our beds, how do we manage, you know, especially maybe vigorous perennial weeds um, when we're building our new beds? As in you're putting the new bed over them? Yeah, let's say you're, we're putting it, uh, you know, onto a new patch of ground. Would you use a weed mat type of fabric underneath that? So if you think the soil is, has some value as far as the bed is concerned, no, what I would do is I would test it, find out what it needs. I would put down what it needs to get it down to, to a basic level. And then I would turn it um, um, as deep as you can with a, with a spading shovel. So you're, you're aiming for eight inches. And then I would reapply that level of minerals to the top of it. And then I would cap that with, um, cardboard um, as your baseline piece. And then I would start building your bed up on top of that. Mm -hmm. Because I would use, so anytime you have an aggressive plant, all right, now it depends. Love if you're trying it. to build this on top of um, uh, Japanese knotweed, that this doesn't count, okay? Mm -hmm. Japanese knotweed, do not try this. But if you're talking about, you know, um, goldenrods, um, regular grasses, um, anything along those lines, I would totally use that as the base of the beginning of parts of your soil. If you don't think that those um, wild plants don't have fully functioning um, rhizospheres and um, associates with them, um, think again, and you want that energy in your system to start with, okay? Now, if you've got a real invasive problem, you shouldn't be putting your raised bed there anyways until you know you have it under control. Yeah, I, I'm I'm with Denise. Uh, fighting a, a mugwort battle is it's and endless. <laughs> it's always there. Interesting, you know, mugwort's a really interesting. Um, you need to buy some goats, or you need to borrow some goats. So we have we have a goat herd, and which is very helpful um, because if you put them out on mugwort and um, a whole bunch of really interesting things like um, bittersweet and. Uh, multiflora rose, you get the best quality milk you've ever had in your life and they will keep it nipped right down and they'll exhaust it to the point where you go ahead and do the turn and put the cardboard over. Make sure that the cardboard comes underneath the supports for the bed, okay? So that you can then control to the outside edge. You will be able to use most of that space um, and make sure it's a 12 inch bed 
And so I have the, so the bed that you saw at the beginning of this, it has a milkweed problem. <clears throat> the next door neighbor in town absolutely loves monarch butterflies. You'll never see any on his milkweed, but he has a huge milkweed crop right behind where those raised beds are. What does milkweed do? <laughs> it comes up. So I'm constantly managing it. Um, and we, we controlled for it at the beginning, but the beds are now five years old and the milkweed comes through. So I just pay attention and pull, take it home and feed the goats. Um, so nutrients yeah. pull going. That's hmm? as I keep the new nutrient cycle going. That sounds great. Yeah, it is. And I know it sounds sort of simplistic, um, but it is a nutrient cycle. And um, yeah. It's just, it, yeah, mugwort's an interesting one. Yeah. Well, I have I deleted it out of a bunch of sites, so I know what I know how to manage it that way, too. Excellent. I want to respect all of our time. We're a little after 8.30, so I'm going to wrap it up wow. tonight. Um, first, of course, thank you so much, ML, for all that great insight and information. I know we didn't get through all of your questions, but that's why we have a whole series of events where we can keep asking these questions, keep bringing them back. Um, uh, we would love your feedback. There's a link to our evaluation right there in the chat. Of course, if you found this event inspiring and informative, please consider becoming a NOFA Mass member and making a donation to help continue this important work. We again want to thank our sponsors, Chelsea Green and Ward's Nursery and Black Earth Compost, who make this event possible as well. Next week, we'll be hosting Christy Higginbottom, who will be sharing many of her tips and tricks for a prolific garden, including um, pest control again, um, some more about disease control and season extension. We have um, we had a lot of questions tonight about compost and amendments, so please come back on March 16th. We'll have Marco Thomas and Laura Davis, who will speak about soil testing as well as choosing biological and mineral amendments based on um, your soils. We are gearing up for our 2021 hybrid NOFA summer conference in August. We're seeking your feedback during our planning process to help us gain more clarity on what type of event this moment calls for. So if you could take a couple of minutes and help us gauge interest um, in a in-person summer conference, uh, there is a, a link here uh, in the chat. So take another, that's another survey, separate survey. If you could take a moment to fill that out, we would really appreciate it. Of course, if you want to continue listening and learning from NOFA Mass, we have our YouTube page. This recording will be up there in a few days. Um, we've produced some great new podcasts. Our conference coordinator, who is also now our podcast coordinator, Jason Falcourts, has a great voice and I've enjoyed listening to his musical accompaniment on all his new podcasts. ML's um, contact information is in there if you want to follow up with um, with ML directly via email. And again, we uh, like to remind everyone we have a garden list serve where if you like to be ha you know type in your question to an email and get a response from the group, um, there's a great way to um, join us and continue the conversation at uh, lists.riseup.net. Um, and you can find that link again in the chat. So with that, from everyone at NOFA Mass, thank you so much for coming, and we look forward to seeing you next time.